This lesson is on the allotropes of carbon, which is the last topic in C3. In your previous lessons, you will have learned about energy. So as a quick review, um, there are a couple of key terms that you should remember. First of all is exothermic. Remember, exo means out and thermic means heat. So an exothermic reaction is one where heat is given out to the surroundings. This is because it requires more energy to... Uh, you get more energy released by making the chemical bonds in the reaction than is required um, to break them in the first place. And so you have a negative delta H, and so you have an exothermic reaction. The excess energy is released to the surroundings, and so the temperature goes up. An endothermic reaction, endo means in, um, so an endothermic reaction is one where the surroundings get colder because energy is transferred from the surroundings into the chemical system. If you were sketching an energy profile diagram uh, for uh, an exothermic reaction, its general shape should look um, like this. So you start with a specific energy level and then you'll have to put some energy in, which will be your energy of activation. And for an exothermic reaction, the energy line um, will be lower at the end of the reaction. So um, there will be the energy going down, so you'll get a negative delta H. Uh, this bit here represents the energy of activation, which we label EA. So that's the just a, a quick reminder of the shape for an energy profile diagram. Uh, the last uh, question on here relates to uh, the equation for energy that we use um, in this topic, which is the same in P1, which is that energy is equal to the mass of the material you're heating times the specific heat capacity times uh, the change in temperature. So for this we do 3 kilograms times 4200 which is the specific heat capacity of water um, and times the change in temperature which is 40 because it changes from 10 to 50. Okay, so moving on to the allotropes of carbon then. So we need to basically be able to describe the physical properties of the carbon allotropes link their properties to their uses and then explain why their physical properties are the way they are. So there are three allotropes we need to talk about. Um, we need to talk about uh, diamond, graphite and fullerenes. Um, now the thing that these have all got in common is they're all made from carbon atoms just arranged in different forms. So if we start with diamond and if we look at the general arrangement of all of them, um, diamond is where each carbon is bonded to four other carbons. So if we take this as the central carbon, we've got one, two, three, and then you can see this bond coming down here, four. So each carbon, and you can check that on any one, is bonded to four others. Uh, obviously this structure just goes on forever, it repeats itself, so it's a giant crystalline structure. In graphite, uh, which is B, you can see that now it's uh, the carbon atoms are arranged in layers and if you look carefully at one of these carbons you'll see each carbon is bonded to three others um, and that's because we get a bond form between the layers here uh, a weak intermolecular force um, which then allows for different properties to be exhibited in graphite and then fullerenes are um, these three in the middle they are effectively football type structures so um, when the carbon atoms arrange themselves as, as a sphere and you can vary the number of carbon atoms um, you get fullerenes. Fullerenes can then be used to make carbon nanotubes which are shown down here. So if we talk about, about diamond you can see that diamond because carbon in the periodic table if you look on the periodic table it will be C12 and then 6. So the atomic number which is the number at the bottom which is the number of protons is 6 and remember the number of protons is always equal to the number of electrons so carbon will have an electron configuration of 2 comma 4 so because it's got four electrons in its outer shell that means that every time it um, forms covalent bonds which you remember are a shared pair of electrons it can form four other covalent bonds so you can see here we've got this central carbon atom and we've got four covalent bonds coming off it. 
Now, covalent bonds are very, very strong, which is what accounts for a lot of the features of diamond. So if we were to look at diamond, we'd describe it like this. First of all, it's lustrous, which is effectively a word for shiny. Um, it's colourless and it's clear, it's transparent, light will pass through it. And that's largely as a result of its crystalline structure. Um, it's very hard. Diamond's often talked about as the hardest material on earth um, that's naturally occurring. Um, but ironically, if you tap it with a hammer, you can cause it to shatter. Uh, again, that's because it's a crystal. And so if it vibrates at the right frequency, um, it will resonate and then and then fall apart. It's also got a very, very high melting point. And those are the two key uses of, uh, of diamond. Um, it's insoluble in water. Remember, insoluble, the word insoluble means it won't dissolve. And it does not conduct electricity. And that is, again, a really important feature of diamond. And it's one that makes it different to graphite. So the uses of diamond then, well, the obvious one is diamonds are a girl's best friend. Diamonds are pretty and shiny. So we use it in jewellery because it's lustrous and because it's colourless. Um, please don't put in your exam because it's pretty. Um, it's because it's lustrous, Remember, which is just another word for shiny. Um, cutting tools um, are m often have edges that are made from diamond because of how hard it is and because it has a high melting point. It doesn't conduct electricity because there are no free electrons. Each one of these bonds is a covalent bond, so each one has a shared pair of electrons in, and those electrons are fixed within the bond. They can't move around, so because there are no free electrons that can move through the material, we don't get uh, any conduction of electricity in diamond. Um, and the reason it's hard and got a high melting point is because of how strong the covalent bonds are. Um, which is again a key feature of diamond. So graphite then, graphite is different because now each carbon atom is bonded only to three others. Um, so we've got one, two and three. Um, and this means that we've got an orbital or an energy level between the, uh, between the different layers of carbon atoms that is free. Now, electrons can then flow through this gap here, uh, and that means that one of the key features of graphite is um, it can conduct electricity. So it's black, which is again an opaque, uh, which is di very dramatically different to diamond, considering they're made from just carbon atoms. Um, it's a very uh, clear physical difference, but it is still lustrous. We describe it as slippery, and this is what makes it useful for pencils. Um, it's insoluble in water, just like uh, diamond, and, but this time it does conduct electricity. So its uses are, it's often used in pencils because of its slippery and black nature. So what happens is when you use it as a pencil, the layers of atoms slide over each other. And so when you rub your pencil against the paper, you're leaving behind a layer of the uh, atoms. A single layer is called graphene. Um, we can also use it as lubricants, again, because it's slippery. Um, and it's also particularly good as an electrode in electrolysis because it conducts electricity very well, um, but has a very high melting point. The reason it conducts electricity, then, the explanation moving into sort of A and B grade, um, is because it has delocalized electrons or free electrons. And these electrons can then move through, um, through the spaces between the layers. Um, it's slippery, as we said, because the layers of carbon are weakly held together and therefore they can slide over each other. So between the layers here, you've got weak intermolecular forces that are holding it together. So the forces between the layers are weak in comparison to the very, very strong covalent bonds. Uh, and so it's still got a high melting point, uh, exactly the same as diamond, because it's got so many strong covalent bonds. So the last one then is fullerenes, and fullerenes are um, spherical molecules. So um, typically um, fullerenes are black solids, um, but when they're dissolved in petrol, uh, they form a deep red solution, as you can see in the picture at the bottom. Now the first fullerene to be discovered was called, uh, since been called Buckminster fullerene, and has the formula C60, and you can see that in the animation. So that is a, a ball molecule um, that's got 60 carbon atoms in it. It's named Buckminster Fullerene after the architect Buckminster Fullerene, um, who designed buildings of a similar shape. And so um, 
it was named in his honour. Um, one of the key features of fullerenes is they can be used to cage molecules. So what I can do is I can put a drug inside the cage um, and that will contain the drug that I'm trying to administer until such a time that I want to deliver it to a specific organ or specific tissue within the body. Um, we can then use fullerenes, um, we can join them up together to form nanotubes, which is seen in the picture. Now nanotubes have got lots of advantages because they are very strong and they conduct electricity. They're also exceptionally lightweight because you can see that a large, because they're uh, cylindrical, a large um, proportion of their volume is just empty space, which makes them very light. So they're used as semiconductors in electrical circuits because of how well they conduct electricity. They're also used as industrial catalysts, um, and they're used to reinforce graphite in tennis rackets. So um, this is because obviously you want um, the tennis racket to be strong and durable, but also very lightweight. Um, the same uh, type of technology is also used in, say, um, some car bodies uh, to reduce the weight of the, the shell, uh, but to still maintain its structural strength. Um, and then nanotubes also work as catalysts, uh, industrial catalysts, and the reasons for this is twofold. Firstly, because we can attach catalysts to the nanotube, and secondly, because the whole tube is, uh, itself has got a very large surface area, and if we increase the surface area of the catalyst, then we're making it more effective. So that is the last part of C3. Um, C3H which is on the allotropes of carbon so you should now be able to describe their physical properties so what they look like um, link their properties to their uses so for each of them you should be able to describe what they're used for and then for A and B grades you need to be able to explain the physical properties so for example in diamond it doesn't conduct electricity because there are no free electrons whereas in graphite it does conduct electricity because of the delocalized electrons